We're here with Kuhn, the CEO of Keokun. That's correct. How important is it for indie devs or devs in general to work together with content creators? I think in the past years that has increased in importance. What I particularly find interesting is most people tend to go to the bigger streamers, but funny enough is that the, the, the tight-knit communities that are all around streaming places, so it doesn't necessarily have to be a big streamer, can make a lot of impact on like what, what people think of the game or maybe try it out. So I think it became a lot more important and especially against the old form of media. I wouldn't say it's unimportant because there's a lot of things you can still reach with that, but it's just changing slowly over time. As a content creator, what do you think is the best way to get in contact with developers? If you're streaming or, or you make videos about something or in an other form, definitely make sure that you put your ultimate form in how you create content up front, explain what is important to your community in that sense, and that can or cannot match with a certain game or developer. If you want to make it feel like a collaboration, it can be something that mixes with some of the material the developer or publisher is making as well. So what I found interesting is that not only did some players play our game, it was also that we asked them, hey, if you liked something about it, can you say just a, a sentence of something that you liked and are you okay with that mm -hmm. if we use that? When we had this idea, I saw this come up and it was so real, really genuine coming from a streamer. It felt a lot more real than, you know, reading that in an article or something. That's something I found interesting that we could offer that also back to the streamer that we featured them in mm -hmm. that sense. What I always try to do is I try to join most content, if it's a, through a comment or through a live chat, I think it's important to just drop in and say thank you in a way. So that also can collaborate something to the streamer because now I'm in their space and I'm talking to their community and they can ask some questions, for example, that is not easily done, you won't expect it. So yeah. I think it's kind of like how you work together on an idea that can work for dreamer and developer. For smaller studios, it's like very important to make a connection with the actual gamers themselves. Are there other things you're doing to make that connection like better? We really like to talk to our community after a release and also during moments that you market something about it. Streaming ourselves so we can get into contact with some of the fan base, but also, like I said, like dropping in on streamers that are playing that not necessarily are our uh, yeah. fan base, but to have conversations with them and they can vary from delicate questions to very funny conversations. I dropped in and I couldn't believe that the CEO would do that. So, and I said, but, but it is actually me on the Kaoken account. Yeah, that's what every marketeer would say. And, but it was actually me. And I said, look, if you ever walk into me on a, on a conference, tell me and mm -hmm. I'll, I'll tell you that it was me. Actually that happened. <laughs> yeah, they were very surprised. Do you think it's important to connect with other developers as well? Yeah, it's a very, very important. What I like about this industry is that it looks like a competitive industry and you have competitors in maybe type of game or genre. The industry itself from within is actually very kind at heart. I just came from a couple of events, for example, at Reboot that is in Croatia, and we're very privileged that we can actually travel to most of them. I heard, I think it was Patrice Desilet, who's the originator of Assassin's Creed, and said, do you realize that our industry comes together a lot and shares a lot of knowledge, you know, shares a lot of technology? That's, I think, why the industry is actually still rather young, and we are so much improving exponentially over the years and that has everything to do with, I think, that mentality of creators sharing a lot of things, developers sharing experiences. That's the product of that growth, I think. Kyoko started off with a Kickstarter. How did that go? At the kitchen table of my former house, of my dad, I sat there with Paul and we said, we have nothing right now and there's Guerrilla Games. And we were like, how can that be the only AAA developer in the Netherlands. We t literally took the whiteboard of our sister's room and started imitating as if we're a company. In a way, we came up with a game idea and eventually that turned out to be not, not, not the one we wanted to debut with, but 
at some point when I discovered Unreal Engine 4 and we had something running up there, the principles, Moon Man, Deliver Us to the Moon. We sold some websites or some work on websites that we could barely rent an office space from for a couple of months. I remember that I read a lot about Kickstarter and also very successful Kickstarters. I was like, okay, so it is going to take a lot of work to make sure that this goes well because we were very green. We didn't have any track records asking for, at that moment, it was a six figure number, 100,000 euros was to a lot of people ridiculous. They yeah. said like, that's you cannot do that without a track record. We had some luck actually. This, this is probably our one overnight success that we got picked up by Gronk, a large German YouTuber and streamer that directed most of his community to this tiny indie, helping them out. I remember my whole phone dancing on the table with the amount of followers I was gaining and I didn't actually know what was happening. I thought like, I don't know, we were being hacked or something. And <laughs> that was amazing to see how that could turn the tide. We actually made that Kickstarter work. No, you don't have to do another Kickstarter again, right? No, it's, I have to say it's always a challenge to, to figure out your next steps. Mm -hmm. So not sure if the climate right now is right enough to do crowdfunding like it was then. You can always resort to it in a way also for some awareness maybe and also for new ip sometimes it's really hard to sell a new idea to partners that you can team up with but i don't think it's necessary for us anymore it is still i think very valuable if you start out with nothing it's always an option if there's other developers that want to start a kickstarter is there something you're like this is something they really need to keep in mind when they start. Because our Kickstarter ran in 2016 and now it's 23. The landscape changed a lot, I mm -hmm. think. Not sure if my advice is still very valid, but I would say don't make your game too cheap. It's not a place that people get a cheaper version of your game once it's out. It is actually the place where you ask for help and that's why it should be more expensive because you're investing in a way in an idea that you help yeah. this developer with. It's going to take a lot of work. So instead, it's not really automatically. You really need to think of probably four to five months of preparation before you go live with it. It's almost like a release. So you guys also started making content yourself, like on social media and streams and stuff like that. When was the point that you were like, oh, we can do this ourselves? That was in our Kickstarter period. So when we realized that that phone was dancing on the table, we saw that there were so many people started to follow us. And instead of sitting still and do nothing, we were like, wait, can we, these people are excited to see our response in a way. So I remember ghetto rigging something of a setup that could stream something. I turned on the stream and people saw our responses. And because this streamer, Gronk, was also planning on a special stream for us, especially nearing the end of the campaign, it was super strange. We didn't have direct contact, but in a way we responded through our stream to our live stream on that moment as a team to what they were doing in mm -hmm. their stream. And that was a magical moment where we didn't directly talk to each other, but we knew this was working. That is also when we realized this is something we should use and, and do in our strategy as a company and as a game developer. We got something really cool lying down there. Moonbear. It's, it's Moonbear. I was wondering, how did Moonbear come to be? Moonbear was a joke in <laughs> Deliver Us the Moon, because at some point, if you look outside the space station, then Moonbear kind of like floats by. It is a backstory of Kathy, who was back then a, a kid described in the lore. It was probably her stuffed animal. So in Deliver Us Mars, we thought like, maybe we should make this more of a thing. I kind of like that cuteness factor of Star Wars movies where R2-D2 is actually kind of cute in a way. It also feels like a very smart robot locked inside this simple body. And that's kind of like also where Ace or, or Ayla kind of derives from in that idea. But also, and, and the little logo of our company is a penguin. And we thought like, hey, that actually fits in how we are as developers and in, mm -hmm. into the game. So at some point it became more of a nostalgic homage to the original astronaut because he's wearing somewhat of the same spacesuit and that reached the game. And eventually our publisher was nice enough to make it an actual toy. <laughs> that's, so, that's so cool. If they want to play Delivers Moon or Delivers Mars, 
you definitely get to see Moonbear. Like, that's the number one reason to already play the game. Moonbear's in there. You, you can't miss out. <laughs> no. <laughs> you can't... Look at how cute he is. Yeah, it's a nice bear. As an astronaut, 